A really interesting question when it comes to endurance training, particular for amateur athletes, but all across the spectrum is how much volume should I be doing? And in this example today, we're going to be talking about triathlon, but this, these principles I talk through are applicable across all endurance sports. And there's a really great question that came through in my Instagram DMs asking about what is the difference in volume for different distances and how do I know how much to do? Am I doing too much? Am I doing too little? So I'm going to break it down really simply. My thought process on how I establish the right amount of volume for a particular athlete. Hey, welcome back to the channel. Nick here talking science of endurance and everything sports science in general. Thanks to everyone who's been subscribing and commenting, sharing all the videos. Really appreciate your support on the channel, engaging our great community. Very, very close to two and a half thousand subscribers. Really want to hit that by the end of the year and I definitely think we can get there. So if everyone just shares uh, the channel to one person that they think might be interested in learning a bit more about the science of endurance and sports science, We'll get there in no time at all. And if anything, we're just going to keep growing this great community. Be sure to also send your questions in. Great question that we had come through in the Instagram DMs. If you want to check out that over at, at NJ underscore sports science, I'll put it in the bottom corner there. Go check out Instagram, send me a message, ask your questions. Really great one that came through asking about how do I actually determine specifically for triathlon, what the volume should be of my training week if I'm doing Olympic distance versus a 70.3 was the specific question. But this really comes down to the fundamental basics of of planning training volume for any endurance athlete. What is too much? What is not enough? How do we actually make that determination? And as was mentioned by the um, by the athlete who sent through the question, asking about, well, there's all these resources. We know that um, on training peaks, there's uh, estimations of TSS or amounts of TSS you should be hitting per week or, or calculating per week to be able to work up towards an Olympic distance or a, or a sprint distance triathlon or a 70.3 Ironman, whatever it might be. Same goes from running in terms of half marathon and marathon. We know there's some rough metrics around load monitoring to be able to go, okay, this is how much I need to progress by. The age of favor in terms of overload is that two, is that really two to 10% overload per week is going to be enough to keep progressing you. But what does that actually look like for a particular athlete? So the couple of things that I go through first and foremost is one, what is the actual event or the, the specifics of the athlete's preparation? Are we training for an Olympic distance try? Are we training for a 70.3? Are we training for a marathon? What is the actual event specifics? Because then I can break down what are the demands and where I need to place most of my time more than anything before then I get into weekly training volume. So if we're looking at shorter distance races, most of my time is going to be focused at higher intensities. That's just more specific to the actual demands of the race. If we're looking at things like Ironman, maybe even 70.3 for a lot of amateur athletes, might be more focused in the volume aspect, building up to those greater distances if you're doing it for the first time, or we're working on the longer, slower aspect because that is more specific to what we're doing. We're not going to neglect the high intensity, but that's just the specifics of it. Once I've got an, an established a, a bit of an understanding for the actual demands of the sport, the next thing is, is well, what can my athlete actually practically achieve in a week? What are their, what is their work schedule like? What are their commitments with family? What are their commitments outside of swimming, cycling, running, endurance performance? Because as an amateur or recreational athlete, we have all these other things to worry about. We're all working full time or, or part time or in some capacity. We all have other commitments outside of our training and racing compared to the professional. So professional, sure, some of them might be able to get up to, I've seen as high as sort of 36. We've even heard reports of sort of 40 hours a week for the really long distance Ironman type guys. Incredible numbers. But at the end of the day, they're going out and training. They're coming home. They're getting a massage. They're having something to eat, going to sleep, wake up, train, repeat that process again and again, maybe throwing a few sponsors events here and there and some Instagram appearances. That's kind of all they're doing really. And nothing away for, taking away from the hectic schedule of a professional athlete because it is quite a, quite a, a time-consuming commitment to be part of that professional scene, but they're not having to go in and necessarily work a nine-to-five job on top of that. If they have family, their family is very understanding because that they're, they're racing and they're, that is their livelihood at the end of the day. So that that is their work time. So they do have that downtime outside of it to, to fulfill those family commitments also. It's the type of thing, very different for the amateur athlete. So I have to factor in, well, what is actually practically achievable that is going to balance the stress from daily life, but then also the stress induced and the fatigue induced from training as well. Some athletes will break down really, really easy once you boost up the volume too high, mainly because the, the combined stress across everything going on in their life, training and otherwise, is then just too much and it causes them to sort of snowball into a large amount of fatigue, maybe burn out a bit quick. 
other athletes are able to tolerate a bit higher training load because of the environment they're in in terms of work, their flexibility of working conditions. COVID this year has been a great example. More people working from home in lockdowns. What does that mean? They've got more time to be able to get out and train in the morning before they start work because they're not doing the commute anymore in the car. Perfect. We're able to get a little bit of extra volume because then there's also, we're not interrupting a sleep schedule as well. We're making sure we're getting good quality recovery to then balance that also. So there's a number of different variables from that perspective I like to tick off before I even then consider, well, how many hours a week are we start to look at? The next thing is what can an athlete tolerate in terms of their previous history with things like injury? If they're a really injury prone athlete, of course, I'm not going to work straight with them and go, all right, let's go high volume straight away. I'm going to build their resist resilience to um, the, the training load, if you like, and, and progressively build their, their ability to handle more and more over a period of time, maybe intervene at certain points and, and change some different strategies instead of going out for a really long run. I know a lot of older athletes and athletes who have some lower, lower limb injuries, things like calf Achilles or chronic injuries like that, where it just occurs again and again and again with high volume. Instead of going out and running for three hours, let's run for an hour and a half in the morning, two hours max, come back later in the day, allow you that rest and res restoration time during the middle of the day, come back later in the day and get that extra hour done. If we're training for, uh, for an Ironman, for example, you're going to be running at the end of the day anyway. So I like using that strategy regardless, but it's the type of thing we can get the similar aerobic capacity effect. You're still running on dead legs like you would be at the back end of that single run. We've just split the volume up in a way that your body can handle as well. So being creative a bit like that, working in and around some of that injury history is really, really critical. Then it comes down to, well, what is actually the demand? Again, I guess we've come full circle here and what is the demand of volume in the training week to allow us to best prepare for that event? I always work off as a very basic starting point, very, very simple methodology of if we need to be able to achieve a particular time or a particular split time. So let's say, for example, in a 70.3, you might be aiming for a two and a half hour bike. When I say that's pretty standard and average for a lot of athletes I work with, two and a half hours is probably there and thereabouts. Some guys are a lot quicker than that. That's okay. Some are a little bit slower, but two and a half hours, let's say as an example, I ideally like to build up as a, as a minimum benchmark build up the bike in a single ride. So this is not talking about across the whole week. In a single ride, I like to build up to about 110% of our estimated split time. So 110% of two and a half hours. I don't actually go in and calculate this specifically and go to the exact minute. I go about close enough. So if we're talking two and a half hours, maybe we're, we're sort of getting to two hours 40, two hours 45 would be the minimum I want to get to before we're racing. So if we had a very short preparation and we didn't have much time to build up from nothing, okay, I'd build up and try and get to two hours 40 odd, two hours 45 relatively uh, relatively sort of quickly in that preparation. When we've got longer time, I typically like to build up a bit more than that. Having that extra distance, maybe three to a three and a half hour ride once or twice is going to be useful. We're not doing that all the time though. Again, coming back into what can the athlete actually fit in. If they can only go out and do maximum three hours on a Saturday and riding, maybe towards the back end of the program, only do two hours 40, so then we can get a run off the bike as well. All these little little bits and pieces we can tweak in and around that schedule because that's obviously going to play a bit, of a bit of a role too. For something like running, if they're aiming to run a, a 140 marathon, maybe I'll only build them up to a 145, 150 or do like the split run as I talked about before again, to try and give them that bit of over distance, but we're keeping the intensity down in these sessions. So we're doing zone two, building the Ks and legs. It's not going out and hammering yourself. It's just getting, can our body work from A to B? Because the end of the day, the body works very similar to a car if you took the odometer out. It doesn't know how far you've gone. It just knows how much fuel is left in the system before it's going to run out. So we want to train that ability to just keep putting one foot in front of the other, particularly the longer the endurance event goes, it's more and more about just continuing to put one, one more step, one more step, get to the finish, Outside of that, it doesn't necessarily, everything else, I mean, we can work on to try and get faster, etc. That's great. But fundamentally, we have to get from A to B to be able to finish our endurance event and be able to then post A time, let alone a fast time or a PB, anything like that. So I like to build up to about that 110%. As events start to go a bit longer, it's going to change practicality wise. If you're a four hour marathon runner or looking to do a sub four hour, I have athletes who do that, some recreational runners who might be interested in doing a marathon maybe for the first time, or they're just trying to get a little bit quicker. If they're aiming for four hours, I'm not going to go send them out for a four hour 10 run. That'd be insane in terms of how much time they'd have to be going out in a single run. I might build them up a little bit more progressively and then do something like a split run or do Saturday, we're going to go out and do two hours and Sunday, we're going to do an hour and a half. There's three and a half hours for the weekend. It's a different way of making up that same total training time in the week and it's a lot more manageable for them. That's still going to hold them in good stead. I mean, our ideal scenarios is that 110% estimated split or race time. If we don't quite hit it, I'm not overly concerned because then the individual difference in that athlete of where they're at, obviously the faster you are, the shorter, the, the less of the time, so the easier it is to get that volume. 
but it's a type of thing I'm more interested in what is specific for that that athlete to build it up in terms of how things shift it's the type of thing in terms of volume in the week and probably the last thing I'll touch on here volume in the week of differences between a shorter distance race and a longer distance something like Olympic distance like I said the distribution's more in that high intensity favor so I may not have I may have more sessions in the week but really short and sharp in, in a lot of places. And then the volume's not going to be as high. Max, we, we need to be running for some of the guys I, I work with. Max, we're running is like an hour, maybe hour and a half to get that extra volume in the legs in a single run. The rest of it's all about how quickly can we run. If we then boost that up to 70.3, well, now we start to lift the amount of volume that we're running. Maybe it gets close to an hour 45 or two hours for some athletes. So really, there's kind of the guidelines I work with. It is quite individual because everyone does have some differences in how they tolerate load. That injury profile I said is really critical and everything else going on. There's no one hard, fast rule. And this is why I think it's a bit dangerous for athletes to work off some of these um, ideal scenarios in terms of like the estimated TSS you should be hitting. Yes, it is adjusted to your threshold and, and, and adjusted to your scores relative to that. But I think sometimes we can definitely overshoot. And that's what the cause of a lot of athlete burnout is. It's not a tailored set a volume for you. It's more of let's do the volume that might be the ideal if we were just looking at training alone. It may not necessarily be factoring in all these other things that might be going on as well. They're just my thoughts. What are your thoughts down below in terms of how you plan out your volume or any other similarities in terms of maybe some things that you picked up on what I do that is similar to what you do? Chuck them down in the comments. Always happy to hear your thoughts and methodologies. Different coaches, if you're watching this, let me know how you go about it. Let's get some ideas sharing around how we build volume because it's something that I'm still progressing and learning what works best for different types of athletes. But it's a type of thing. I think the, the system I've used so far has been quite effective to get a really qu good quality, minimum effective dosage. So doing the minimum to get the maximum benefit and not particularly not necessarily having to do excessive amounts of training for that amateur or recreational athlete who's got all that else going on. As always, continue to subscribe to the channel. Really enjoy the support on the channel so far. Hope you're enjoying the great content. Head over to Instagram, ask your questions like we had in this video. It always sparks some great video ideas and keeps the content coming on this channel and, and tailors it specific to what you want to learn and hear as well. That is it for today. I'm going to leave it there. Thanks for watching and we'll see you in the next one.